all remember what went down in the theaters. After the most epic game of keep away ever played, Thanos got his mitts on the nano gauntlet and everyone went in panic mode. Unfortunately, Infinity Stones are not something to be trifled with. The snap clearly affected the Mad Titan, and destroying the stones almost killed him. So, Tony's snap turned out to be fatal. For the deleted scene, we got to see that realization work its way across the battlefield as first Hawkeye takes a knee, and then everyone else nearby. Ultimately, it was decided that it replicated the emotions of the funeral scene that was able to include other characters not present at the final fight. It also gives us a bit of an insight into how the Infinity Gauntlet works. Tony only knows the name Gamora as the thing that provokes Quill into ruining the plan. As far as Tony knows, she's dead. When he snaps out Thanos and his army, Gamora is not included, despite the fact that she only left Team Thanos during the battle. This means that the stones do a bit of interpreting of the Gauntlet Wearer's wishes. Tony wanted Thanos and his team gone. The glove made a determination on who was on that team. The next up is a little bit of domestic bliss for Tony Stark and Pepper Potts. The loving couple are seen being a regular loving couple instead of superheroes and CEOs. It's not a heavy scene or a very dramatic one, but does have a few almost Easter eggs in it. The main conflict is whose alpaca it is that keeps eating the Gobi Berries. There's a smaller, more Marvel-related moment in what seems like a throwaway line when Pepper asks Tony to fetch their daughter for lunch. Pepper refers to Morgan as Madam Secretary. While it might seem like the high ambitions of proud parents, it also reflects one of comic book Tony Stark's day jobs when he was appointed Secretary of Defense. There are also two quick scenes that don't provide story so much as they ask the questions that fans have been asking for a while. First up is a brief conversation between Rhodey Rhodes and Steve Rogers. Rhodes and Rogers are discussing the fate of the Tesseract, one of the Infinity Stones that really got around. But what Rhodey and Steve are discussing is the fate of the Tesseract in World War II when it went into the ocean before Steve went into the ice. What Rhodey wants to know, and so do we, is why Captain America went down with the plane. Was there any need for him to ride the plane all the way down? The second comes from Rocket Raccoon. While everyone else might have a degree of reference for Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Rocket lives in a world of extraordinary beings. Superpowers are the norm for him, rather than the exception. Not only that, but he has a smuggler's cunning. This includes an encyclopedic knowledge of all the threats that he might face and what their chief weakness is. The Chitauri, it turns out, have a pretty catastrophic weakness. If you take out the mothership, the entire army collapses. With a weakness that bad, the Chitauri apparently are considered the worst army in the galaxy. Not something that the Avengers want to hear after the Chitauri invasion took such a toll on them and the Earth in general. Regardless, the space-savvy Rocket finds a great deal of humor in the fact that the Earthlings didn't know that the Chitauri had such an exploitable weakness. His laughter is interrupted by Tony Stark giving the snarky raccoon a reverse mohawk. This would have been the third in the rule of threes between Tony and Rocket. First is Tony not realizing Rocket was a living thing. Their second encounter, Rocket reminds Tony that he's only a genius on Earth. Perhaps it was best this scene didn't make it after all, because then we'd have to put up with a Rocket comb over for the rest of the movie. We get even more Rocket in his 90s Polygon video game look with Thor on their leg of the time heist. This scene, like most of Thor's scenes in Asgard, deal with Thor and his trauma after losing so much over the last few movies. While dude Thor had been played for laughs, there was deep and real pain that Thor was dealing with. For Thor to then return to Asgard on the day that his mother was killed, that would be a lot for anyone to take. Rocket's patience for the man who he once admired starts to run thin, but Thor is able to clearly articulate the emotional weight of being back in Asgard after watching most of the people around him die. There was also a scene for people who double-dipped their cinematic endgame experience that featured the Hulk doing some run-of-the-mill day-saving. The Hulk in his Smart Hulk or Professor Hulk iteration jumps into a burning building to save people trapped inside. For someone who started their time in the MCU hiding out and trying to mitigate the destruction and wrath of his alter ego, it was a way to demonstrate that of everyone, the Hulk had probably the biggest arc over the course of the MCU. 